this session uh, in which a panel of artists and performers will be talking about Pacific arts and culture um, and also exploring the impact that climate change has had on artists' livelihoods in the Pacific. Uh, the session is part of Living God's Future Now, the online festival of theology, ideas and practice from Heart Edge. And Heart Edge itself is an international ecumenical movement for renewal within the broad church. We're a network of churches growing compassionate responses to needs, cultural and commercial activities and congregational life. The Living God's Future Now Festival began in March 2020, and it consists of a wide range of lectures, sessions and workshops from a diverse group of ordained and lay leaders from all over the world. We'd ask you for this session to please remain on mute unless you're invited to speak, as this minimizes background noise and will enhance our recording. However, we do encourage you to write any questions or comments that you have into the chat, and uh, those will be introduced, uh, we'll introduce as many as possible um, into the conversation as the conversation goes on. So feel free to post those as soon as they come to mind and also to use the chat to discuss uh, questions and comments with other participants. Now, we're meeting uh, today, uh, not long after Fiji's Prime Minister, speaking on behalf of the Pacific Islands Forum in preparation for COP26, has said, we refuse to be the proverbial canaries in the world's coal mine as we are so often called. We want more of ourselves than to be helpless songbirds whose demand serves as a warning to others. And that um, is a part of the wider context in which our conversation today um, takes place and uh, hopefully will connect with those uh, sort of sentiments and thoughts um, as uh, the conversation progresses tonight. We're going to be guided through that conversation by our facilitators for tonight, Katrina Talay Eggleston and Sulu Dernavulu. Um, both have been involved with the celebration of Pacific arts and culture, uh, which um, has been specifically in the lead up to COP26, a festival that has been produced by Pacific Island Art, Artists Connection and has been hosted at St. Martin in the Fields on London's Trafalgar Square. Um, so I'm uh, very pleased to welcome both of them um, to this session tonight. They're going to introduce themselves and then introduce their guests and then um, begin the conversation. So it's over to you, Katrina and Sulu. You are both very welcome. Reverend Jonathan. Uh, hello and warm Pacific greetings. These specific words welcome you to the inaugural uh, panel of discussion that's organized by the Pacific Art Festival exhibition, Contemporary Pacific Voices on Arts, Culture and the Natural Environment. Um, my name is uh, Sulwo Danivalu. Uh, I'm a Fijian I'm from Fiji, I'm an art critic, gallery owner and creator and entrepreneur on, and social equality advocate. Uh, and I'm based in, in Riga. My co-host, uh, Katrina tyler Ingelson will introduce the panelists. Now I'm handing it over to you, Katrina. Nakka. Nakka Sulu. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Like Sulu said, my name's Katrina and I am currently based in the um, Sainsbury Research Unit in Norwich at the University of East Anglia. And I've spent a very long time now kind of jumping back and forth between the artistic and academic side of life. Um, I come from a British and Fijian background and I'm really, really pleased to be here today to help guide this discussion. But before I say anything else, I would like to acknowledge Vanessa Eden, who is with us and she is the grand master behind this entire Pacific Art Festival. So she will be looking at the questions with um, Reverend Jonathan and also helping to facilitate that side of the conversation. But without further ado, we'd really like to welcome, we've got three artists here with us tonight. 
we have Michelle Rounds, Natasha Vaiki, and Navi Fong, and I won't introduce them for them. I'll let them do the job for themselves. But in introducing themselves, we would also like to pose the first question. So after your brief introduction, Michelle, uh, Tash, and Navi, can we please hear about your experience growing up and what the main cultural and creative influences were on you and how they led you to be where you are now? So if I could pass the mic to Michelle first, please. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Okay, I unmuted me. <laughs> Lovely to be with you. Thank you so much for including me on the panel. My name is Michelle Rounds. I'm from, I was born in Australia, but my background is Fijian, Tongan, Samoan. So it doesn't matter who's playing rugby, I always win. And my mother is European. I grew up uh, for 11, first 11 years I lived in Australia. We lived in Australia, then we moved to Fiji. So I did my secondary schooling in Fiji. I'm currently based in Cairo, Egypt. My husband is Egyptian. And I am a singer, songwriter, recording artist, educator. I am basically a musician. So regarding the question, the first influences for me, of course, were family because I hadn't gone to school yet. So I would hear my father playing guitar and singing and he would do that regularly to my mother. So I would just see him singing songs to my mother. And I just grew up thinking that that was what every father did. I thought that was just part of it, part of the job. Um, later, as I, when I went to school, I realized it was different. And then of course I, was, I started listening to radio and I, the television came, <laughs> yes, uh, back in the day of the dinosaurs. And then I could see a lot of other music. But prior to that, I'd really been exposed to a lot of jazz and guitar work, things that you could play on the guitar. So Gordon Lightfoot, Joni Mitchell, this was what my father was listening to, Julie London. Um, that was the cultural influence. Then my grandparents came from Fiji to live in Australia and that just opened a whole new door because they would have parties and at every party, everyone played and sang music. It wasn't a big deal, it wasn't discussed, it wasn't like you just picked up instruments and started singing and playing. And that was just, we were exposed to that constantly through our childhood. And my grandmother's Tongan, so she would speak to me in Tongan and she would also, she taught me the first song I learned in another tongue other than English was a Tongan song. So that was, I was very young then, that's me. Thank you, Michelle. Can Thank we you, Michelle. Can we move? Um, we lost you a bit there, Katrina. What, what was it? Um, could we move to Tash, please? And there are a few people unmuted. If everybody could mute their mics, please. Um, I'm Tash and um, my background, I hail from the, the, the Cook Islands and in, in particular Maya, which is the southernmost island of the Cook Islands. And um, I have been uh, dancing and performing for the majority of my life. Um, and uh, in, in order to explain probably more about myself, I'll answer the question at the same time. Um, my background um, in dance and Cook Island dance in particular stemmed from my greatest sort of um, inspiration. And that was one of the beautiful women that um, helped raise me when I was a child. Um, and living with her, she was one of Maya's top um, orators. She was a holder of the knowledge. She was um, a choreographer. She was um, had the knowledge of, of all the tupuna, of all the ancestors, and she would use that to, um, to work with and teach the youth. And she was my greatest inspiration to the point where, you know, she would dream her choreography. She would wake us kids up in the middle of the night. We'd have to get up and dance it. And, you know, and that culture continued in, in within me. And I do believe she gave me that gift of, of continuing it on. So um, I moved to New Zealand when I was um, to go to secondary school. Um, 
and continue with that. It was a brand new experience going to New Zealand and, you know, there were lots of new sort of cultures to come across and work with and all the rest of it. But, um, yeah, sort of stayed with the uh, Cook Island culture and my culture, um, carried on into university and helped set up one of the, in our university, one of the first Cook Island groups in our university. And that carried on, moved moved up to Auckland and joined a Pacific um, uh, Polynesian, sorry, I'll get my words right. I don't like speaking online, so <laughs> bear with me if I'm nervous. Um, joined uh, Pacific Bamuru, which was a professional island dance troupe in the 90s, very, very successful. Um, so yeah, that the, the teachings that I had grown up with and why are the teachings that I'd been gifted with and raised with, um, both in the um, sort of the, the cultural knowledge as well as the choreography, as well as the drumming, uh, the music, everything like that carried on with me through those years of dancing around the world and touring and whatnot. Um, and ultimately moving over here to the UK 22 odd years ago, um, I established um, Beats Polynesia over here. Initially, it was to make sure that my children, my own two children, were able to have their identity here in the UK as first generation UK Pacifica um, and be raised with our culture, our values, um, everything that I had been raised with, everything that I had been given and taught and, and uh, um, you know, being, being, I call it blessed because I know children around the world these days don't always get that. Um, whereas I did, and I was incredibly blessed. So established feats of Polynesia here in the UK to initially ensure that my children had it as well. Um, and um, it's just been amazing since then. So my greatest sort of influence and motivator was in Ngāra Papatua back in, in, you know, when I was a child and helped raise me, an amazing woman, so. Beautiful. Thank you, Tash. We've got, last but not least, Navi. Would you like to share your story with us, please? Yes. Thank you, Katrina. Um, well, everyone, my name is Navi. I am Navi Huang Kaim, as my name suggests. Uh, Fijian, part Chinese. Um, my dad is part Chinese from the island of Taviri, Buna Taviri, and I am Basu Rakiraki Alekandavu. I was born and raised here in Fiji, and I'm still here in Fiji, loving it. Um, very blessed to still uh, be here doing uh, the work that I'm doing, which I haven't introduced yet. So um, I'm a I'm a dancer and a choreographer with World Dance Fiji, which is a contemporary Fijian dance company in Fiji. Um, I work with so many young, uh, amazing artists, um, dancers, and costume designers, and lighting technicians, and it's uh, really rewarding to be able to do the work that I'm blessed to be able to do every day. Uh, when I think about what my artistic and cultural influences are, um, I think one of the first things that comes to mind is uh, my childhood and the things that I was exposed to as a child. Um, having been brought up in the city, in the city, in Suva, um, <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, in some ways, growing up in that reality of being in Fiji, but not really where you're from, you know, like being up, um, away from your um, actual root islands, that sort of local diaspora that a lot of us young Fijians find us um, in. It's it's a lovely mix of being exposed to traditions and and also a different version of what those traditions are. So um, I think that's where a lot of my inspiration and inevitably that's where my inspiration and my influence came from. Um, being at the Angona ceremonies or being at um, cultural ceremonies that were, you know, within a church environment or um, uh, it's just the family functions. I come from a very musical family, and I think that's where a lot of the artistic influence came from, even though I'm a dancer now. But that artistic um, environment, um, every single family function, as Michelle was saying, like, it's very much the same, um, was just like the sitting room or the lounge wherever the whole extended family was gathered. It was littered with guitars, nylon strings, and steel strings, and you had to literally step and color with you over everything to get to the kitchen. And um, you know, just uncles and aunties, they wrote every single person knew how to play guitar or play the piano and sing. And um, that sort of, that home environment, I think, uh, uh, coupled with the cultural, um, those um, urbanized cultural traditions that we have here in Suva, sort of uh, provided the impetus, you know, for me to move into a career path that explored that, you know, because it is, it's not something that we talk about quite consciously growing up. 
So I think the career path that I'm in is kind of out of necessity for me as a young person to figure that out so that I can also, you know, figure out my trajectory and projection of where I'd like to go as well as the young people around me. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Tatiana. Thank you so much, all of you. I think what's really interesting is that all three of you talked about the sheer significance and importance of family and childhood and growing up, rooting yourselves in the in the career paths that you've chosen and that found you and that you were blessed with. And I think it's all very serendipitous, isn't it? Um, Navi, you just talked about everything that we're working together on for the Urban Pathways Project with the youth and this local diaspora and, and encouraging youth to find you know, their creativity and cultural heritage as a means of, of providing for themselves. So the fact that all of you have managed to do this, I think are amazing examples for all of those who are up and coming and wanting to take a creative cultural career path. Um, so yes, on to you, Sulu, question two. I think Vanessa has a hand raised, she'd like to add on. Um, just one of the uh, questions in the chat is from Anne, who was just asking if there's any examples of work, art, music or instruments or dancing and dancing outfits that um, the group could see an example of. And I'll see if I can share something on chat. But if anyone, any of the panellists have something that they can share on the chat or have anything close to hand that they could share with the group, sort of whether it's uh, costumes or... Um, yeah, just examples of your work nearby, <laughs> um, or things that Michelle's you have. Got, Michelle's got her hand up and is waiting to be unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I didn't. I, I'm on a phone, so I can't type and do things like that. But for for those that are interested, Michelle Rounds is my name, and that's my website, michellerounds.com, and you will see my work on YouTube and all the main, uh, all the other uh, media partners, all everything, Spotify, iTunes, etc. And in that, you'll find not just jazz, but also some Fijian Tongan songs, which I've covered in a different, slightly jazzy way. Um, so that's just my contribution to what Anne was looking for, some examples. So via my website, thank you, Anne, for asking. MichelleRounds.com, if anyone wants to write that up for me. Thank you. And also I can share. And also I can share. Oh, thank you. Oh, I can share the Bo, Bo Fiji YouTube uh, channel as well, because that will give examples of, of Bo. Wonderful. It's amazing to see the similarities and, you know, the Pacific as it is, it's, it, it's, it's really encompassing. Everything is communal. And I think that's how most of us learned uh, growing up because we saw our, our parents, grandparents did all that. And that's how um, things were passed down. So moving on to the second question, um, given that we've got a mix of Pacific uh, and diaspora based artists here on the panel, it would be interesting to hear about the, well, we've just covered that, the similarities and differences in practices uh, when thinking about climate change action. How do you view climate change in relation to your work and what impact does it have on you? Um, so we begin with Michelle, if, again, if that's okay. Hi, thank you again. Um, I saw a question, uh, not a question, but a comment coming through and using Natasha's words, it is, it is a blessing to be brought up with music and dance and to not have that. Nobody ever said to me, oh, are you going to be a singer? Because everyone in the family, as Navi said, everyone could sing, everyone could play guitar. It was just like no big deal. Nobody, you know, you just became, you, if you wanted to go professional, there was this massive team of family behind you going, oh, you want to be professional? Then you go this way. This is how you do it. There's no like, you know, you don't pay your dues or go touring or I'm going to just, you know, do whatever I have to do. They were right there behind saying it goes like this and it goes like that. They were very professional. My father, my uncle, my grandmother, all of them professional musicians. So in answer to that comment, you are right. It is a blessing to be brought up with music and dance around you all the time. And this is the culture of the Pacific. Regarding your question, Sulu, um, it's almost like I can't talk because musicians, I mean, music has a huge carbon footprint 
end of story, we do. Um, but as other musicians say, I would rather be called a hypocrite than sit back and say nothing. Okay, so our, our carbon footprint is not as big as say heavy manufacturing, but it's very big. Um, so it's through music and musicians that we're writing lyrics, we're creating stuff that people want to hear and they go, oh, well, and if we start talking about stuff like climate change, if we start bringing this to the attention of the public, they're going to listen to that. And I think this is where we have some power or some clout. Um, there are a lot of, you know, people are looking at us, what's she wearing today? What is she going to be doing? Or where, where are they going? You know, this is how you become an influencer and all of that, yada, 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 rolling, rolling, rolling. But at the end of the day, we do bring out issues, but whether they're political, climate change, uh, et cetera. So I think we have, again, we are, it is hypocritical because we have a huge carbon footprint. We're traveling and the industry itself makes a big dent. Um, but I think that we kind of try to repair that or at least try to make up for it by creating the awareness when this climate change started happening and scientists were actually becoming emotional and bleating about it, which they normally don't do. They just write papers and stuff. And they were bringing it to the public and then the musicians picked it all up and started running with it. Artists, actors, they're all starting to make movies about this stuff. So that's my contribution to the climate change thing. Hello? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Um, uh, over to you, Tash. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I agree with everything that um, Michelle has said. We, the, we have a platform that we can make a difference with um, within the, the arts realm. Um, and I know for, for what we do quite often now when um, we, uh, over here especially, it's a, it's a way of trying to educate the new generation. It's a way of trying to teach them what, what's happening in the world. And um, we've been known to do it through using um, different forms of, of items in our, in our costumes. Um, so if we were to make a new set of costumes, we would make it and teach our young people who are making it with us, well, we're gonna use this, this material because actually it's wasteful to throw it out and we can damage the environment. Why not reuse it, recycle it, you know, put it into our costumes. And it's a way of teaching the young people that nothing is to be just discarded, thrown out and make a, a difference in that means. We also um, go and do a lot of work in schools and we do a lot of teaching and we use, um, like Michelle said, with the composing, we compose things that would help, you know, teach within our, what we do in workshops and so forth. And it's getting that message across quite often when we're introducing where we're from, back home in the Pacific, we will use um, videos and whatnot and do a little bit of teaching as we go before we teach the item. We might say this item comes from this, this nation and this nation is suffering right now um, and explain why and various things like that. So it's, it's for us, it's a, mean, it's a way of using our platform to teach, to provide it through our dance workshops, through to pr provide um, a means of teaching through what we do with costumes, through changing, changing the mindset of our young people and, and try and instill it that way, instill some knowledge that way. So, yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Tash. Uh, over to you, Navia. Um, uh, I'm sure you'd have a, a bit more to say about this because this is, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. thank you. I'm not sure if I'll have more to say, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to find my way. Um, yeah, I think it was the thing that, um, you know, especially, now I'm scared to say this because of what, um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, like the whole, um, how we sort of preface this whole session with um, Reverend Jonathan talking about how, um, the Prime Minister had said something about refusing to be, you know, the damsel in distress when it comes to the whole climate conversation. Uh, but it goes to the thing that we're at the forefront of everything, you know, being in the Pacific and you smack dab in the middle of a giant ocean. Uh, it's, uh, so in terms of our artistic work, or that my, my practice at least as an artist, um, and it's influence, the influence that it takes from uh, the climate reality, the climate um, crisis. Um, I think a lot of what we make as artists or what I make, uh, I start, it's, it's hard not to be political, no matter what you do, whether it's entertainment or, um, you know, actually speaking to some sort of political issue, uh, 
um, directly. Uh, when you're doing it directly or indirectly, I, I feel like all artistic work in some way or form is political just by being a voice. It's like, if so long as you're saying something, um, it's going to be political. And I think when, when I start to make a conscious decision about what I'm talking about as a creator, as an artist, I, I tend to want to craft the voice, craft um, what is being said around what is not being said already in that conversation. So like a lot of the climate works we've had to create over the past few years uh, have spoken to the, the, the has spoken to the things of, uh, about climate change or the areas of climate change um, that aren't being spoken enough about. You know, um, I, I think it was Michelle who said something about, you know, um, scientists and figures and uh, it's very easy to drop your Venn diagrams and pie graphs with all those charts and statistics and to be from the Pacific, it's nice to give those figures uh, a human voice and to like, Actually, we are the numbers, you know, like um, put ourselves on stage or um, put our voices out there and, and talk about the human experience of what it is to be going through this. Um, so that's kind of, I think that's kind of how it influences the, the way uh, my artistic practice um, how, how it works, how, how it, um, yeah, how the creative process works, uh, because I, I, I start to think about what's not being said, what isn't being said in this conversation and how can I contribute to this conversation. Um, without taking away from it. And I acknowledge as well that, you know, uh, as uh, within that work and by doing that work, there is a footprint we're making, a carbon footprint we're making, you know, like we made the Winston piece and then toured it. You know, like, um, so um, you make something about climate change and then you, and then in the process of having to get that word out or having to uh, present that story, that voice, that narrative to the wider audience, the carbon footprint that um, is sort of inevitable in that process is uh, something that we need to think about as artists individually or collectively with a, uh, on how we offset that footprint. And um, it's it's interesting to see, um, uh, interesting to hear um, Michelle say that about uh, the, uh, the hypocrisy and I'd rather be saying something and be a hypocrite. <laughs> um, I think this is a cool way to think about it. Um, yeah. Just because um, every time we make climate work, because we have been like several times over the past 10 years, um, every time we do make climate work, that's definitely within the conversation about, okay, if we can't be doing this, we need to be thinking about how we're going to offset our carbon footprint while we make, you know, while we put up our lights and put on our costumes, uh, what are we doing in like, you know, in the basics of um, making sure that we aren't contributing to the problem and we're part of the solution. Yeah, I'm not sure if I answered the question, but um, no, no, that was very insightful, uh, um, Navi. Um, and it's true what you said, uh, what, what, as an artist and a performer or a painter, uh, it's hard to be apolitical because your voice can be misconstrued in any way. So um, yeah, that, that was very insightful. Thank you. Uh, does, does anyone else have anything to say? Sorry, yep, go ahead. Um, Vanessa? Then, so just a um, very interesting question from Sebastian in the chat, um, which I, I won't read all of it, but I, I think of the gist of it, and I hope I got this right, Sebastian, is asking if um, a lot of tradition is, is quite is guarded, but do you think that um, the symbolism and agency of patterns through, for example, tapa or through dance or through learned tradition, do you think it's understood by the younger generations? And um, yeah, I think that's the gist of that question. Um, I'm not sure who would like to answer that on the pan from the panelists. Uh, Katrina, would you like to answer that? I mean, I can add on. I think will it turn, it, it depends. I, I would just say a few words and then I'll pass it on to you, Katrina. It depends on in what context. I think in the Pacific context, if you grew up in the Pacific, everybody grew up. Uh, knowing the patterns and, and, and their stories, which is, which is, you know, passed down from your parents, your grandparents, and, and you learn that. Um, in, in Vanuatu aspect, everybody still, are still uh, very much doing um, sand drawing on the sand, and they're still doing sand art. So, I mean, Katrina would have a bit more to say on that. So uh, go ahead, Katrina. Thank you, Sulu. Um... I think for the most part, motifs and patterns are understood in different ways in the context that they need to be at the time that they need to be. I think maybe that's the safest way to say it because not everybody has that full information nor are they, um, or nor is that information accessible to everybody. It's kind of what you need to know when you need to know and how it informs your, your contextual 
need to need to know things. Um, like Navi was talking about earlier, I think it's very interesting for urban youth and these local diasporas, as, as they're called, and diasporic communities like Tash talked about her children being here in the UK. Um, you know, these patterns and motifs, I think they end up, and I guess for me growing up in Canada as well, they end up meaning something quite different to diasporically placed youth and communities than, than they do in other situations because there is that more intense need to connect to tangible aspects of cultural heritage and arts and culture. So um, it is very different all across the Pacific and we can't just cherry pick and say, yes, it's very important because of this or no, it's very important or it's not important because of that, but it is very contextual and each nation and culture does have their own specific connection. And with information, you know, knowledge is power and intergenerational knowledge exchange is power. And people will learn these meanings when they're meant to and when they need to. Um, oh, but I had my hand up. I forgot. I had my hand up for a question. Um, <laughs> and it was to Navi. Sorry, Navi, I'm putting you on the spot again. But did you maybe want to say a little something about Vo's involvement? Was it COP21 that you did the piece Sinking? Was that COP21? Because COP is such like you said, such a political thing. How was that to be an artist and be involved in such a global phenomenon, really, as we're coming up to COP26 in 10, 12 days time, I think? Uh, personally, I think my instinct, thank you for the um, I think my uh, instinct, my like, whenever there's something sort of like directly political that we are uh, involved in or that we are commissioned to be a part of, um, is I just get quite nervous just because, you know, when you're in that sort of sphere, when you're in that world, um, it's very easy to, you know, step on people's toes and get people hurt and be insensitive and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of my first thing, just because I am a very sensitive person and uh, I just like to, um, you know, I don't, I don't, don't want to come, I don't want to be politically incorrect around those spaces. So um, being informed, the, the influence that that has in turn is like it forces us to be informed and to be stay par um, current and just to keep up to speed with what's happening. And it's very easy when you're in the um, you know commercial grind of everything here in Fiji and to get lost in that and to just completely isolate from what's happening um, outside of outside of everything. Um, so I work like that, like I was with Pop21, um, really, you know, it, it's such a polarizing um, feeling, you know, to be, you know, to have to, to be performing as an entertainer on the daily. And then, you know, like I said, you get lost in that or you sort of become, you know, uh, you call it, what's the word? It's just quite monotonous and repetitive. And then to have work like that every now and then, you know, every couple of months, it's work that pulls you into a different headspace. Um, that it's, it's refreshing. It's polarizing, but it's refreshing. It, it, um, uh, politically, it keeps us, it keeps, it keeps us sort of on our, you know, on our toes. It keeps us in check. It keeps us accountable as a dance company, as a collective, and me as an artist personally. Uh, that particular work that uh, we did in Pop 21, that video, are you referring to the video one? The video with the spoken poetry, yeah. Uh, that was a really uh, important, important work that we had to do. Um, it took a lot. It took a lot to do it, but then it was just a one-minute video that they wanted. But that one minute took a lot of effort, and um, the conversations that came out of that, you know, in the following years, and um, are really important. You know, that that work was uh, brought back again in 2018, where we were asked to develop it into a live performance, and uh, we did it on the beach. Um, and yeah, it's just interesting to see how those different, and then like back to the Are We Strong Than Winston that was like five or six years ago, and then we had to rework it and turn it digital the other way around. Um, just seeing how, the, like seeing that, I think the most um, rewarding thing is seeing that those works aren't just like put on stage for the sake of a ticking a box and then they die. Like the conversation is continuing even like five, six years down the line, like it, and it's developing, that conversation is developing, it's evolving. Um, so yeah. I, uh, even though it makes me nervous, I love going into this. Thank you. 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Navi. Does anyone else have anything else to add uh, before moving on to the third question? All right, wonderful. So we'll, we'll go right to the third question. So, I mean, moving forward, uh, given the current times we're in and you know, most, most places in the predicament with the, the lockdown and, uh, uh, you know, many things that are closed and, you know, especially most artists that are, uh, you know, they rely on, on, on performing for their livelihood. Um, how do you see uh, uh, your practice evolving uh, moving forward in, in this, I mean, strange and wonderful times that we're living in? Um, oh, yeah, we'll start with Michelle, if that's okay. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Vinata Su. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, what happened was last year in March was when it hit. Egypt, and that was it. Every gig I had just crashed. Lost all my work, finished, no jobs. Prior to two or three months prior to that, I had been contacted um, by a company and they said, we do live streaming. I didn't even know what live streaming was. I'd never heard of it. And they said, and we pay you. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm too busy. A week or so later, I went back to that email and I checked, I, I replied to them and I started live streaming in January. And it was something I knew nothing about, had never heard of, didn't know how it worked, but I just started doing it. I'm singing jazz and, you know, people in Japan are going, yeah, yeah, this is good. And as I said, in March, bang, I lost every single gig I had. So it's the technology and the internet that kept me alive last year, because basically the live streaming was provided my income, income for both my husband and I. He still had a job, but we both were live streaming. As a consultant to the Aman Jazz Festival in Jordan, we had to then put the festival online. So we had a live uh, video shoot. So the bands were in a, in a venue, they were shot and it was all uh, recorded and put together beautifully, lovely edits, etc. put onto YouTube, released at a certain time, at certain times, so it was like a festival. And then it stays there, of course, and anyone can watch it at any time. That was so successful that I begged our director to please don't ever take that away. No matter how live we get, no matter how no virus and everything, we're all safe and everybody can travel. There was nothing, we have never done anything like those videos. They were spectacular. And we would never have thought to do that because we're, it's a live festival. Just, you know, we put snippets up here and there on social media and you can have a little look at that. And maybe one of the bands puts a video up and maybe we put a little bit, but this was the festival up on YouTube. Absolutely incredible, beautiful lighting, just everything. The whole vibe was amazing. So what I think has happened with what has happened in the globally is that yes, live is important. Yes, we still need to, I'm talking as a musician, sorry, not a, as a dancer, of course. Um, Yes, we still need to record. We still need a live audience, whether that's a live audience on social, on social media, by live streaming, like now people are typing in and saying stuff, or if it's, you know, face-to-face -face in a, um, now you talked about looking and listening for what, yes. Okay, okay, I can't go to that one later, <laughs> sorry. So I think what we're gonna have in the future is a combination. We're not gonna just have live or we're not gonna just live stream. I think we're gonna have to incorporate and have far more online than we ever did before. That's my final word on, on what happened all of last year. Um, yeah. And yes, regarding things that are not said, I like that. I was hoping Navi would talk more about, am I stronger than Winston? Because that was a climate change issue, was it not? Or have I got that wrong? Okay, I'll mute myself now. Yeah, over to you Navi, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The Winston production was kind of. Uh, we weren't gonna when we, when we when we set up to make that production, it wasn't going to be about climate change at all. Actually, um, uh, we had like different concepts and things that we wanted to talk about at the time. But uh, within the process of the, the creative process, um, Winston happens, and um, it was it would just have been so remiss of us to not you know like, uh, not speak about that experience um so and uh i think as we got together as a collective and thought about what we'd like to say one of the things that was obvious was that everyone had been through a lot of loss at that point 
and it was such a devastating and tragic moment for the whole country and um, for the dancers individually, personally. And uh, that was the only thing that it, it, there was no other option. You know, we had to speak about it. And uh, naturally, as we were creating, it was it was um, it was very natural for us to be very personal and connected to uh, the piece that we were making because because it was fresh and it was raw. And uh, I think it. At, in hindsight, it was after after the fact um, that we realized that a lot of what we had to say and what we were putting into the piece was unlike what most climate conversations, uh, climate crisis conversations are about. Because uh, for you know one of the first times, not the first time, but like um, for the first time or in uh, the festival that we took it to or um, just anywhere, um, people were finally hearing like a human voice to the numbers that we're so often conditioned to seeing and being so desensitized by it. Was, um, um, talking about climate change is such a statistical thing. And um, uh, to, I think to be able to see, uh, you know, people not making work about a foreign concept, but making work about something that just happened to us two months ago, you know, like um, uh, was a different experience for a lot of people. Uh, so being able to talk, uh, talk about, have conversations and uh, perform and, you know, explore those human concepts around climate change and the human experience of uh, the human cost um, was a really special part of that entire experience. Yeah, I hope that we... Do I answer the, the question now? Lisa, we're not Kanavi. Was that, um, yeah, yeah, no, that was very, that was very good. Um, uh, yeah, over to you, Tash. Um, your experience and in, in, in this. My experience is this, in this wonderful and question. trying times we're living in. <laughs> um, well, obviously, we were over here in the UK, we were hit quite hard um, and are just coming back to so called semi normality um, at the moment. But um, I've got to admit, from, from my personal point of view, I didn't embrace the sort of uh, technological side of life as, as well as you sound to have, Michelle. I kind of, as, <laughs> um, in terms of uh, us as artists over here, um, we, we did shut down for a bit, um, and which was in a way a shame, but in a way, Kind of it, it kind of hit this whole COVID thing hit us with such a bang. We were we were lost, and like Michelle said, I was not very good on the whole technological side. In fact, I'd never had much to do with it. We were always live. We perform live, um, and one of the most beautiful things about our performances is the live drums and the the energy that you get from it. And for for me trying to put that in some scope online seemed impossible at the time, you know. And I was just like. You know, what are we going to do? Luckily, <clears throat> I also have other income. So it wasn't about the money for me, but it was about retaining what we had built up over here for such a long time. Um, and sad to say that a lot of our, our people, because of course, being in the UK, a lot of people that we work with um, in terms of our group over here, in terms of our, um, our performing, our performers, um, all venues uh, shut down and our performers started going home um, and a lot of them moved back to the Pacific, a lot of them um, moved back to wherever they came from and you know of course it's totally understandable but it did leave us sitting here with a, um, a core group of people um, and a little bit lost in terms of our, our you know what we do over here. Um, so it kind of, uh, it, um, sitting through the months of lockdown, um, we did try and put a few things online. We tried to at least keep our dancers motivated, try to um, put a few fun things online rather than actually put it out to an audience. We put it out to each other to keep ourselves going. Um, and I think that was such a big thing because many, many of us suffered quite um, heavily and our mental health and um, because movement and dance and everything is so much a part of who we are, not to have that on a, on a three, four times weekly basis and we're confined to our homes. It, it was a big, it was a big mental battle for us as well. Um, so we would do things for ourselves. We would um, try and entertain ourselves online, getting together and do lots of things like that. But it also sort of um, led to, for me personally, to a lot of reading online and um, 
bearing in mind that whilst we were in our major parts of lockdown over here, um, it wasn't so bad over our side of the world back in the Pacific, you know, at the time. Um, so it meant that a lot of our people over there were pushing each other, doing wonderful things that I'd never had a chance to look at before. And, and um, it kind of uh, made me realise that a lot of our, who we had left here in the UK, what I call our core group, were actually um, first generation UK Pacifica. They were first generation young people and they're here um, permanently, which sort of led on to how we can we can evolve as a group and we can make our young people our focus and make sure that our young people are spotlighted um, because actually they're pretty incredible for being raised over here, some of them born here um, and not having, um, I think somebody mentioned earlier, not having the roots of, uh, I think you did Katrina, the roots of home, the roots of family, the roots of everything, but being raised away from that. And yet for so many of our young people here, they have ret retained their identity, they have retained their culture, their language, their nationality, everything, their heritage, who they are, their ancestry. So part of what I'm aiming to do in the future is to evolve by looking at ways in which to um, bring that to the world focus because we're so proud of those people over here, so proud of the young people, um, and to take that further. Um, and, and they are the core of who we've got here now, whereas the young OEAs that used to come over have all gone home and so forth. We, we are left with these amazing, amazing young people here now to work with and start something new and do, whether it's online, whether it's in person. Luckily, in person seems to be okay again or starting to you know revamp over here. So I may get away with not having to do much online, which would be, um, you know, very, make me very, very happy. Um, but it, it would um, change its focus a little bit to making sure our young, our youth here and our young people are acknowledged for how amazing they are and to come through all this, being UK Pacifica, being raised here um, and just being an amazing young, young bunch of people. So, yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Tash. That, yeah, that's wonderful. It's so true. Nothing beats uh, live performances, but yeah, we, we find that with these times, we kind of uh, have to adjust a little bit. Yeah, but I still agree that live performances are the best. Sorry, Vanessa, you've got your hand up. Um, yep, go ahead, Vanessa. I um, noticed, Jonathan, you uh, posted a question about um, something that Navi mentioned earlier about uh, sort of being inspired often by conversations that Aren't th things that aren't being discussed and that can sometimes inspire your work. And Jonathan, I don't know if you want to say a bit more about that and expand it. I just thought that was a really interesting um, concept and I wondered whether um, that featured at all in uh, the process of inspiration for Michelle or for Tash with developing new work, um, whether this thing of um, trying to look or listen out um, for things that aren't being said, um, aren't in the public arena, um, whether that features at all in in um, inspiration for, for either of you. Uh, do, do you want to go ahead, Navi? Or... or... Sorry, well, um, thank you for the mic to answer that. Michelle? Michelle had her hand. Okay, yeah, Michelle. Hi. <laughs> Is, are you talking, Navi? Okay. Um, I've only written one social injustice song in my life. Everything else is all about love, no love, lots of love, from love, all of that type of thing. So I've never written politically. I probably never will. I am non-political, and I mean that in the absolute real sense of the word. I have never voted in my life because I don't believe that anyone deserves to vote. You don't give me five rubbish choices and tell me to pick the one that's the least worst. I'm not choosing. So I have never, ever in my life voted in any country. Um, and I've won the price. I've, I've, in Australia, I was fortunate because I could write a letter saying that my personal beliefs prevented me from voting. 
Um, but I think in other countries you could go to jail and I would have done that. I would rather have done that than gone to. Um, so I leave those things to people like Navi and Tash, if you guys are doing works that are sharing information and giving us insight into things that are not being spoken about. I'm not ignorant. I know what's going on in the world, but I choose not to be a part of it. I'm in it, but I'm not of it. I will never be of it. So that, and also I did want to ask, Trisha wrote something and she asked a question of me. It's in the, it came up at the bottom. I couldn't read all of the question and the lady yeah, yeah, I was going to yeah, 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 um, okay. okay. Sorry, Michelle. Um, uh, it's the, the, the question was given Michelle's experience, how should audiences or government support artists to be able to pivot to live stream by tech and enable alternative income streams? Do enough platforms exist for artists which are supportive and not exploitive of, of culture and what, what institutions can help? Okay, uh, Trisha, there are um, live streaming sites that do pay the musicians. I was, my husband and I were earning monthly income being put into our PayPal account for the, the live streaming we're doing. I was just streaming jazz. He was streaming Egyptian Arabic songs and he was dancing and, and these, this, there's a particular app and I'm, I don't work for them. So I'm not, I'm not being paid to say this. It's called One Seven Live. One Seven Live, it, is, it was created for artists, visual artists, dancers, mixed media artists, singers, anyone doing anything. There are people doing crafts, a lot of crafts people, woodworkers, people, anyone who is doing a craft or an art form of any type. Of course, there are a lot of um, people from the oldest profession in the world. There's a lot of those as well. We can't really control all of that, but they actually are a legitimate company paying us monthly to live stream. So yes, I have no idea how it works with governments. I know that it's, it's an American, no, it's not. It's a Taiwan based company. Um, and one seven L-I-V-E live. I can't recommend them highly enough. They're fantastic. Yes, artists of any media, any, anything at all that you're doing, even if you're just teaching, you could be teaching somebody English. You can live stream that. You'll get a whole bunch of people come on and start asking you questions. What about this word? What about that word? So yeah, there are some legitimate platforms out there. Obviously, there are a lot that are rubbish, a lot of them that don't pay, a lot of, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, 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 uh. but this one does. And that's who we're still with. We were with them all of last year and we're still with them. Good luck, Tisha. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. I think Wonderful. Uh, thank you. I think do. Please do. Probably, um, Navi, you might be able to add a bit more on, on the TikTok world. Is that is that also like a, a streaming app that would be, um, you'd have a bit more insight on that? I feel like I'm being profiled because I'm the youngest. No, um, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, man, um, I mean, I, I with, with the, as Michelle was saying, um, like given the whole global predicament and um, especially when it hit last year in March, and we lost everything, uh, gigs, performances, everything, like just down to zero, all plans out the window. You know, after like a couple of months of lockdown, when we finally reconvened and we're in the same space, albeit two meters apart, um, it was, you know, such, it was a golden opportunity for us to sit together and rethink what our sort of raison d'etre was and like uh, rethink, like why, why it was that we existed as a company. And um, that sort of, catapulted us into a different direction, a different trajectory. And um, uh, part of that new trajectory was to start to, you know, um, go digital and virtualize everything. And um, not entirely, but to have that diversified version of what we do. Um, so we, uh, in addition to our live performances, we do have, we are starting to branch out now into like creating a digital library and we'll you know, have our repertoire recorded. And um, which is why when, you know, when um, uh, Vanessa, uh, had asked for you know a um, recorded version of our songs and Winston to make snippets. I was more than happy to do it because now you know that can become part of our digital library and, this, and because there's more um, bigger demand for that now. Um, so being able to not just shut down everything that's live and take it all online, but uh, to diversify how our our um, 
art is delivered or experienced has been a big part of what we've been doing over the past two years post pandemic or coming out of pandemic. Um, yeah, but with regards to TikTok, I have no idea. I know that um, there is there are uh, like one or two dancers within the company that sort of manage that. Um, I personally have no clue. I okay, are you you're probably referring to my personal TikTok? <laughs> I don't have a personal account, but um. I feel like that's just you know a small part of that whole venture, that whole uh, endeavor to make things uh, to have a more online presence. And um, I agree with what Michelle was saying about uh, being able to monetize that is such an important part of it because for a lot of us, it's not about um, doing this, you know, for the fairies and stuff. This is it literally pays our bills, and you know, it keeps people. It's the livelihood for a lot of these artists. And um, being able to monetize those platforms and monetize the work that we put on those um, live streams and the different uh, online platforms that we choose is a big part of that. And that's something we're still trying to figure out. Being coming from the region that we're in, Fiji, and like not many of those, um, like YouTube or whatever platforms we decide to use, not many of them allow for uh, that monetization to happen in our region. But um, we're figuring out what that is, you know. And um, it's 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 um, while it is quite scary, it's also exciting because it's new. Um, and, you know, none of this would have been, we wouldn't have thought of any of this had, had it been for the pandemic. So in some ways, it's kind of like a blessing for us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Navi. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot about TikTok, but I think, it, yeah, I, I didn't realize that yeah, TikTok is not a money earning thing. <laughs> it's just putting your art out there. Uh, but thank you for that insight. Well, I think I think it's about time to start wrapping it up, really. But one thing that um, both Tash and Navi touched on and the idea of climate change and getting the youth involved and teaching the youth and, you know, saying things that aren't necessarily said through your art and things like that. Um, Sulu and I have both had the pleasure of being at COPS and um, we were both at COP 23 in 2017, so directly after um, Winston devastated not only Fiji, but also Tonga, Samoa, quite a lot of the rest of the Pacific. Um, and what you said, Navi, is absolutely true in that, you know, what artists are representing that need to be said are the exact opposite about what's being talked about in these really large scale events. And, you know, I, I went to a seminar yesterday where somebody was advocating that culture didn't need to be an SDG, that culture is just kind of in its own kind of everything. So it doesn't need to be its own separate thing. And I think it's reasons like that, that's exactly why art and artists and performers and musicians and everybody are needed in these spaces and to be part of these spaces in these major um, conferences and negotiations to show the people and not the numbers and the faces and what is being affected and who is being affected because the Pacific is the largest affected region in the world from climate change and they do the least to um, produce all of these harmful things that are in the air and in the ocean and in the world. So having art and having something as accessible as artistic expression and representation is so very much needed in these global spheres and and um, meetings. So thank you all for talking with us today about your feelings, your passions, your everything. And we just really appreciate your time and your energy and your mana and your everything for being with us today. So thank you very much to Michelle Rounds, to Natasha Vike, to Navi Fong, and thank you also to St. Martin's, to Heart Edge, and to Reverend Jonathan. Thank you so much for hosting us and being the wonderful person that you have been to host us for the last two weeks, not even just tonight, but thank you very much for um, hosting our Pacific Art Festival and welcoming us into, into the world of St. Martin's in the field. Thank you so much. Well, it's been tremendous to, um, to have you at St. Martin's um, and we're thrilled that the exhibition um, has gone so well. Um, for anyone that um, is able to get into central London over the next uh, two days, there's uh, that, that's all that remains of the opportunity to see the exhibition itself. Um, it will close on Saturday 
um, but uh, we do encourage you to come and see it uh, between now and then. Um, and I want to extend my thanks to all of you um, for this evening's conversation to Katrina, Sulu, Michelle, Tash and Navi. It's been a fascinating um, conversation. It's been tremendous to hear uh, about some of your personal inspirations, about the way in which um, you're working with and adapting and using um, your cultural influences and uh, also to hear about uh, the very real impact of climate change and the pandemic on your work and experience. Um, there's much that we're going to take away as a result um, from hearing all that you've shared. So thank you so much for that. Um, just a reminder before we go that there is a second panel session um, which is happening next Thursday, so Thursday the 28th, but it's uh, at the opposite end of the day. Uh, it's going to be 10 o'clock in the morning if you're in the UK and 9 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and um, uh, I've put details about that in the chat. Um, so please do register and you'll get the link sent to you in the way that uh, has happened tonight. Um, and for that panel, uh, we're going to have a panel of faith and climate mitigation leaders, um, including uh, the Archbishop of Suva um, and uh, others. Um, so thinking um, uh, and spending more time thinking about what it is that the Pacific needs um, from COP26 um, and um, uh, how the uh, the injustice that Katrina was just talking about um, can be uh, addressed within the context of that really important meeting. So do join us next Thursday, um, but thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists um, for all that you've shared. <laughs>